So what kind of world are you going to be investing in over the coming years? Well, very simply, it's going to look like this. There's going to be relatively low rates of interest and relatively high rates of inflation. Inflation is going to be higher than interest rates. Now, I'm not going to get into the detail right now of what that means or why I believe that's going to be the case, because that's what we covered in our previous video. So we'll link to that. Do make sure you go and watch it, because that will give you an understanding of why I'm saying that what's going to happen is going to happen. And that means that you're then going to really understand why these five principles that we're going to run through are so important. So the first principle is forget about growing your wealth with savings. The kind of conditions that we're living in now and will continue to be in the future is often called stealing from savers because you might start the year with £100 and then, thanks to interest, end the year with £102. But because inflation is higher than that, the amount that you can buy with your £102 is less than you could have bought a year ago with your £100. So you are actually losing out even if you appear to be winning. The second principle is to take on debt responsibly. So if the rate of inflation is higher than the rate of interest that you're paying on your debt, then all you need to do is invest in something that keeps up with inflation and you'll come out ahead. You don't need to make any kind of genius investments. You win purely from the fact that you've taken on this debt at such cheap rates. And by the way, by taking on this debt, you're in exactly the same position as the government, which owes a huge amount of money. They want to benefit from these conditions and you can as well. The key word here is responsibly. You still need to make good investments. If you borrow money and you invest it in something that goes to zero, that's still a disaster. It doesn't matter how cheaply you borrowed the money. But the key here is that inflation helps you out. If you invest in something that goes up in line with inflation, then that holds its value. Whereas the amount that you've borrowed is a fixed number of pounds that's losing value. And over the course of a year, that doesn't look like anything dramatic, but over not even that many years, it does become really significant. So if inflation runs at just 4% a year, which is above target, but significantly lower than it is today, and it does that for 10 years, then a third of the value of your debt will have evaporated, even if you never pay off a penny of it. And remember, all of this is just the effect of inflation eroding the value of your debts. If you invest in something that does better than inflation or something that pays you an income, well, then you're winning twice over. The third principle, is to avoid fixed income investments. And the most popular type of fixed income investment is bonds. Now, this is controversial. Financial advisors will say that lots of people should be holding bonds. And to some extent, they have a point. There are some, some circumstances where it makes sense. But I think bonds are actually a bad idea for far more people than is typically thought. And especially that's the case in conditions when there is inflation, because fixed income means that you are being paid a fixed amount of pounds. You might own a bond that pays you out two pounds a year and you paid a hundred pounds for it in the first place. That two pounds is fixed. But inflation means that two pounds is going to be worth less in terms of what you can buy for it over time. So again, just like savers earning interest, you might be getting paid out an amount of money every year and see your bank balance going up, but that's going to be actually worth less with every passing year and could actually leave you losing money after taking inflation into account. The fourth principle is to invest in real assets. Um, what are real assets? Well, kind of like it sounds, real assets are anything that you can physically touch. So infrastructure, property, commodities, things that are actual physical things in the world rather than financial investments like shares. Real assets are attractive because they benefit from inflation. And there are two particular types of real asset that I think are particularly interesting. One is commodities, the other is property. Commodities are things like oil, gas, corn, gold, things that are actually needed in the production of goods. And they tend to do well when there is inflation because inflation tends to be the result of an economy performing well. There's more and more being produced, therefore there is more demand for these materials, therefore the price goes up. Therefore, if as a result of inflation, oil producers decide to put up their prices by 10%, there's not a great deal anyone can do about it. They kind of have to pay the price because saying, no, I don't really need any oil, thanks, just isn't an option. So commodities are attractive because they benefit from inflation. The other type of real asset is property. And property is attractive for three reasons. 
The first reason is that it tends to not just keep up with inflation, but outpace it. Between 1845 and 2016, it outpaced inflation by an average of 1.1% per year. So you can see that it's got a long track record. The second reason is that the income it generates also keeps up with inflation. Unlike that bond that pays you a fixed amount every year, the rent that you get from a property you can actually put up in line with inflation. Rents tend to rise in line with inflation, so you've got an income stream that also grows and so you're not losing out as a result of inflation. And the third benefit is that it's a great way of taking on debt you tend to be able to get quite a large amount of debt quite cheaply by securing it against property, which ties back in to principle number two. Now, the fifth and final principle is to invest in the stock market boringly. Now, I don't actually think, for various reasons, that the next decade is going to be a particularly good one for the stock market, but you probably shouldn't ignore it completely, and you can hold it easily in an ISA or a pension, so it is attractive. But you do need to be careful and really invest in the most boring way possible. And I mean boring in two different ways. The first way is to avoid exciting companies that have got a great story and great potential, but aren't really generating much in the way of profits now, because those types of companies are going to do very poorly in the type of future that we're expecting. Companies like Netflix, Peloton, Zoom, they've already massively dropped and really I don't see that they're going to recover because the growth story of well we're going to make a load of money one day becomes less attractive in this kind of environment. The second way to be boring is not to try and pick individual winners at all and just invest in a global tracker fund. That means that you get exposure to a tiny tiny proportion of thousands of companies around the world and that means that if the stock market grows on average then your investment will as well it means you're not going to have any amazing off the charts wins but you're also not going to have any huge painful losses you're just going to achieve the average and that's pretty desirable at a time like this where you don't want to try and be too clever it's very easy to make mistakes it's easier to lose than it is to win so there you go five investment principles if you follow these, I strongly believe that you don't have to be the best investor in the world. You will still do well because you are making the right investments for the conditions that we're going to see. And that puts you in such a better position than if you were a great investor in a particular sector that's just not gonna perform in the years to come. So I really do believe that you will be a far better investor by keeping these principles in mind. And remember, I talk about all of these in my book, The Price of Money, it's out now. We'll put the link in the description below.